Cotopaxi has made their mark in Salt Lake City, not just with bright patterns and colorful gear, but because they dedicate at least 1% of their revenue to nonprofits doing anti-poverty work. And now, until December 24th, if you spend at least $200 in the Cotopaxi store and tell them I sent you, you will be gifted a free Luzon backpack, which you could re-gift, just saying. Visit Cotopaxi.com to find a store near you. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. Search for Economist Podcasts Plus and sign up to our free one-month trial. Here's what Salt Lake's talking about. If we are almost certainly getting the Winter Olympics again... Will we see major changes to our liquor laws? And how much easier will the state of Utah make raising a glass as early as next year? Today is your annual Booze News Roundup and Liquor Lawmaking Forecast. It's Tuesday, December 19th. I'm Ali Vallarta, and this is CityCast Salt Lake. Fox 13 reporter Ben Winslow, we are looking back on a year of booze news, and we're looking forward to what the future will bring. It feels like the biggest news for Salt Lake right now is that we're very likely hosting the 2034 Winter Olympics. What sort of changes could that bring to our liquor policies? It could bring a lot, potentially. Uh, Really depends on what the legislature does, because Honestly, what we saw when we got the 2002 Winter Olympics was the end of private club memberships. Mm -hmm. Uh, You remember those? I don't know if everybody does, but uh, that's what we saw uh, when you had to have a sponsor and you went into the bar and and it usually was just some random person you saw. So we could see some changes to make it more, shall we say, hospitable to people who aren't from Utah, like we saw previously. Uh, We could see similar to what uh, the All-Star Game brought, where you had pop-up liquor stores to meet demand. That's that's one scenario. All roads lead to Capitol Hill, and it just depends on what they're going to do with it. Yeah. Okay. So if we're thinking about an event like the Olympics, that is an this is my favorite expression of yours. That is an all roads lead to the legislature example. Like there's not much the DABS could do for a short term event like that. There is a little bit that they can do in statute. For example, like the pop up liquor stores that we saw during the NBA All Star Game. That is mm. something that they can do with existing. It's, it becomes a budgetary function. But okay. in terms of like statute of maybe making things more accessible, let's say legalizing mini bottles. That clearly has become a legislative function again, even though as an aside, the legislature put it on the DABS, the DABS advanced a rule, then the legislature decided it was best for them. But a lot of these major policy lifts, bar licensure, how many licenses we get, those kinds of things, those are a legislative function. I mean, I imagine with an event like the Olympics, well, let me tell you my Olympic dream is basically that all of downtown becomes just like a giant beer garden. <laughs> and it's like, you know, you, you're pulling sort of an event permit for the entire city. But I've heard people say that what's on their wish list is also like wine in grocery stores, like some of these things that could stick long term. And those would be legislative functions. Those would be things that would have to be codified in state statute. A uh, wine in grocery stores that was proposed with a ballot initiative that you may recall was introduced and reported on this earlier this year. Yeah. But it didn't get very far. The funding didn't come together, a lot of the support to get this off the ground. And ballot initiatives, as we all know, it takes a lot of effort to gather the signatures, to qualify. Then you have to run an entire campaign, maybe anticipating opposition, things like that. And, you know, there would be a lot of opposition to something like that. You think about a number of groups, social conservatives, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, those who have well-documented positions on 
alcohol. So all of this would have to be a legislative function. If you want your beer garden in downtown, that's one of those things that I could see that being a very heavy lift because you have to determine what are you going to do with minors. Does that mm. mean that minors can be in this area or do you put people in certain areas? I mean, you think about any festival that you go to where they have like a beer garden or a place for cocktails or spirits. Um, it's usually walled off from everybody else. And minors are definitely not allowed. There's an ID check because, of course, you know, from the legislature's perspective and from a public safety perspective, you don't want minors being able to access this. Uh, no one wants that. But it becomes a mechanism of how do you ensure that minors aren't illegally getting access to alcohol? I mean, it does seem like the legislature is more interested in navigating these kinds of logistical hurdles when it comes to events that bring in a lot of visitors. But as residents, like we would like them to take up this stuff as it impacts our day to day lives. Like, why is it that there is the the will they managed to find the will and the way when it's for visitors to Utah, but not residents? I don't know if that's a question I can answer per se, mm -hmm. because I, a lot of it deals with how much of it are they hearing from constituents. And lawmakers are actually pretty responsive to their individual constituents. It's balancing the competing interests that you see on Capitol Hill. And it's the give and take of legislation. And there's a lot of interests on Capitol Hill when it comes to matters of alcohol policy. You think about when we raise the alcohol level on beer to 5% ABV, not 0.05, which is the DUI level. But there's <laughs> always right. a give and take. And you do have a number of groups that have feelings and very strong feelings about this. And they are not afraid to engage with their legislators. You know, mm -hmm. and so it becomes an issue of how much are you hearing from your constituents about these types of issues? And is it enough that it's going to wind up in legislation? And, you know, this is the same advice I give to everybody is never be afraid to contact your lawmaker about issues that you feel are important, regardless of where you are on the political ideological spectrum. You should be talking to your lawmaker anyway about your feelings about this, that, the other and the bill that's going on Capitol Hill, whether they're doing good work that you like, whether they're doing bad work that you don't like. Let them know. Yeah. Well, I mean, you brought up the ballot initiative effort to get wine in grocery stores, which, to your point, like couldn't come together. It's very expensive to run a ballot initiative in Utah. You need a lot of signatures. But sometimes I think of ballot initiatives as like publicly run messaging bills. So do you think that even though that proposal didn't make its way onto the ballot, that maybe it sent a message to lawmakers about interests around wine in grocery stores? I think it did. And I think it does raise that issue. I mean, you look at previous ballot initiatives that were successful. Cannabis, redistricting, Medicaid expansion. These were all issues that had been brought up to the legislature before, and they chose not to do anything with them. That's how we got medical cannabis in Utah. It was a long and expensive and, you know, rather divisive campaign with a lot of stakeholders weighing in on this. And voters did ultimately make the decision that they did. Ballot initiatives, not saying they're easy, not saying they're cheap, but, you know, there is is that sort of path for them. Um, and yeah, there, there is an argument to be made that it is a message that is sent. And it'll be interesting to see what sort of things appear in next year's omnibus alcohol bill, what lawmakers are looking to address as they hear from a number of different stakeholders. I mean, you have hospitality industry, you have restaurant industry, uh, you have the bar industry, you know, all in that sort of larger hospitality industry group. You also have people who are more in favor of restrictive liquor legislation or more in favor of public safety and ensuring, of course, that people aren't consuming alcohol and getting behind the wheel of a car or things like that. So they got to balance yeah. all of these interests. And that's what I think will be interesting when you see what's in next year's bill, whether they address certain concerns or certain issues. Then there's always the issues of technical cleanup. They pass a law. There's an issue that pops up that they didn't foresee. And then they address it in legislation. Yeah. I mean, what I'm hearing from you is that there are basically a lot of different interests that are trying to get legislators' attention around these issues, and they might have opposing views. Based on what we've seen in the past, what arguments tend to work? Like, is there an economic argument that usually seeps through? Is it more of an emotional appeal? 
I think what you see is all of the above, really. There is the economic argument that this makes good business sense or that you are hampering the ability of a small business to do this or you are impacting the ability of an industry entirely to do this. Then there's the balance of competing public safety. You know, certainly no one wants youth accessing alcohol you don't want people uh, getting behind the wheel and driving drunk, those kinds of things. So you have to balance access with public safety. And those are the interests that you typically hear the most from on Capitol Hill when it comes to this particular sphere of policy. Written by Lin-Manuel Miranda, Hamilton is coming to the Eccles Theater for a strictly limited engagement from July 31st through September 1st. Featuring a score that blends hip-hop, jazz, R&B, and Broadway, Hamilton is the story of America then, told by America now. Get tickets and give the gift of Broadway this holiday season at broadwayattheeccles.com. Salt Lake, I'm really excited that I get to do an ad for this company because the owners are awesome and their cider is divine. I am talking, of course, about Second Summit Cider in Mill Creek. Second Summit is a women-owned and family-run cidery. The ciders they produce on site range from classic to more adventurous. I'm a sucker for a really green, dry apple cider in the winter. But I've also had a great time with the prickly pear, poblano, and cranberry flavors. If you are headed to a holiday potluck, picking up some fun locally made ciders is a great addition. I think you're gonna like the ambiance at Second Summit Ciders Mill Creek headquarters. From beautiful pickleball courts to group games and shared tables, they're bringing people together to unplug. And if you're looking for local beers, distilled spirits, and non-alcoholic drinks, You'll find those too. And dogs, really good dogs are always welcome. So stop by the tap room and see why everyone is talking about Second Summit Hard Cider. Well, you brought up the liquor omnibus bill, which we've sort of come to expect every legislative session. We've got yet another legislative session in January. Have you heard any rumblings? Like, what might we see in there? Ooh, let's see. I think one of the big things we're waiting to find out is if we will get more bar licenses. So right now, this is how it works. And it's kind of interesting because right now Utah has one bar license issued per 10,200 people. Why that number, you wonder? It's completely made up. (laughs) It means nothing. (laughs) They just pulled it out of nowhere. That is the ratio. But because bar licensors are so coveted and there's so many businesses that want one and that there becomes this sort of pent up demand and this this just scramble for it where it becomes Willy Wonka's golden ticket, mm-hmm. uh, even the point where DABS commissioners have complained and told people to contact your lawmakers if you have problems with this, lawmakers finally said, okay, Let's order a study to see if we're really an aberration here in Utah or whether or not we're more in line with other liquor control states. And so that's going to be interesting to see what the study says. It was supposed to be presented recently in an interim session of the Utah State Legislature, and it didn't happen. The study wasn't complete. So what I'm curious to see is if before the next legislative session, we finally get that study and if it provides any more insight into Should we have more bar licenses? Governor Spencer Cox has been in favor of increasing bar licenses in Utah, believing that it makes good economic sense, it's good for tourism, that kind of thing, and that they can address those public safety concerns. But obviously there are people who very much disagree with him on that. And so this is the tension that we see play out every year on Capitol Hill. But that's probably the number one thing I want to see what happens. I think that what you're going to see in the omnibus bill this next session, or at least as lawmakers have led me to believe, is a lot of just technical fixes, nothing significant. There may be some more funding for additional liquor stores in Utah because there is a shortage based upon the studies that have been conducted for the state of Mm state-run liquor stores to meet the population demand. But that becomes a budgetary issue of do you have the money to build all these new liquor stores and will it, you know, continue to raise money for it? And can you, again, can you guarantee public safety, all that stuff? So uh, stay tuned on the omnibus liquor bill, but the bar (laughs) licenses is the number one thing that I'm going to be watching for. Well, it's interesting because when we think about like 
more bar licenses in the state of Utah. I was so surprised. I think it was in the November DABS meeting that the city of Torrey, which has been kind of a tourist town for a while now, got its very first bar. It's actually a cidery. And like statewide, there are some of these tourist towns that really would like to see more bar licenses. But as maybe you know, I've been drinking at every bar in Salt Lake County this year. Yes, I have. I have been following your progress with interest. (laughs) One of the things that I've noticed as kind of a theme is that we really lack neighborhood bars. And one of the biggest barriers to that is like proximity to schools and churches and things like that. Like Citizens just opened on 3rd East. I'm ready to call that a neighborhood bar. There's Paxton's Pub that feels like a neighborhood bar over by the Target on 3rd West. Do you think that we could see changes in the future to the accessibility of neighborhood haunts? Proximity remains an issue, and it's been defined and redefined by the DABS and the legislature before. And this is how close can you build a bar to a church or a school, which if you live in Utah, you've certainly looked around and you notice we have a lot of both of those. Mm -hmm. So it is a little more tricky than, say, other liquor control states where there may not be so many churches and so many schools. And that proximity has been measured in the past in different ways, as the crow flies or as, you know, is it a literal translation of how close are you to something else and whether that allows you to get a liquor license, be it a restaurant license or a bar license. So that is going to have to be a legislative thing. It could wind up in an omnibus bill. It has been considered before. It's been uh, modified in the past. I just am not sure at this point where it is right now and if there's an appetite to address it at least in the next session. It could show up. It could not. Someone told me that once upon a time, if you wanted to open a neighborhood bar, you could get written permission from churches to open. Do you know if that's true? I know this has been your beat for a while. Yes. I mean, there is this thing called local consent. And and this is something that happens with uh, liquor applications or liquor license applications that go before the DABS all the time is, uh, yes, there is this idea of is there an objection to it being here for many reasons. There could be a number of issues like do you want to build a bar next door to an Alcoholics Anonymous Center or something like that. Mm, you know, yeah. there there, there can be neighborhood concerns that uh, somebody has or community concerns that may need to be addressed. And it's not necessarily that a church would say yay or nay, because you think there are some faiths here in Utah that actually do consume alcohol. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that may not be a concern for them. They'd be like, oh, yeah, we're, we're totally fine with that. But there can be other community concerns, and typically a city council will uh, address this before you go to the DABS and get your license because the DABS, I sit in these meetings all the time, and they, they say, yes, uh, they have local consent, they have you know the support, and so they're good to go. Usually a lot of communities are in favor of this because it can be a revenue generator for them. Well, you call the Department of Alcoholic Beverage Services, which we're tenderly calling the DABS here, you call those meetings a bar license gauntlet, which has really stuck with me. Because as you've mentioned, competition is really stiff for a limited number of bar licenses. But heading into the last DABS meeting of the year on December 21st, it looks like there are eight licenses available. Is it unusual for us to end the year with this many? There was some reworking of licenses by the legislature earlier this year while they ordered this bar license study. So there became more that became available. What the DABS has been in, at least the commission, is an interesting, if not impossible, situation. Mm. These licenses, because they are so precious, they cannot hand them out unless a business is ready to go. That means, are you ready to open? So they've started triaging businesses on the agenda saying, is this one ready to open? Are, if we gave them a license, could they open tonight or tomorrow? You know, like, they are you ready to go? The problem for a business is if you're opening a bar, you've staffed it, you've hired people to work there, you have built out everything. You are running a business without the thing that helps you run your business, which is the right. license that allows you to run your business. It's this weird, vicious cycle that nobody really likes. And there has been discussion about should we have the laws changed to kind of allow for less of this turnkey thing. The commission ultimately is the one that makes the decision. And that's just what they've had to do because of the limited number of licenses that they have available is, are you ready to open? If we gave you a license, could you just be serving by that evening? And so that's just kind of the process that they've created at this point. 
such a wild, wild thing. I do want to ask you before I let you go, like, is there one liquor-related policy item or change that we've seen this year that you think people might not know about or is really important for them to know about? I do have one. I did a story on it recently, and people okay. may have missed this. Uh, so if not, here's your, your news recap. In 2024, the DABS is going to launch online ordering, <gasps> which means it's going to be curbside pickup. So think about like grocery stores where you order online and then you go and you pick it up. Well, that they're doing mm-hmm. something similar. It's a little different because, you know, it, we are talking about alcohol here. But what okay. they are doing is the, the way it would work and they're finishing up the website and everything, getting it ready to go so that they can launch it probably summer 2024, but you would go online. You would select your local liquor store. You would pick the products that you want, put it in your cart, and then you would go to the store, show your ID, and walk out with your stuff. So saving you a lot of time, particularly during the holidays, as we all know, when state-run liquor stores kind of get a little busy, and I'm being very kind when I say get a little busy. It's a madhouse, let's be honest. Line Uh, out the door. Yes. And so, uh, you know, it could certainly take a lot of the stress out of it for consumers. And if you have been in newer built liquor stores lately, you'll notice there's an area that sometimes says will call. Or, or like, you know, something like the, uh, collect or something. They're building for this. To, to, so a special counter where you can go and pick up your order. But again, the, the rules will be you'll, you'll need to show your ID so that they can verify that you're not buying alcohol with mommy's credit card. Right. But it saves at least a lot of the shopping time. Uh, so that yeah. that's definitely something I think people should know about. And at least the people I've talked to outside liquor stores when I lurk, they're very excited about that idea. Yeah, I'm sure we'll get high utilization, especially the liquor stores that are like, I mean, what's that one downtown? Is that Fourth West? That's always just that one's going away. Total chaos. Oh, it's going away. Yeah. So the Pioneer Park area liquor store is going away. That one will be replaced by a new one, which is on Broadway between State Street and 200 East. Uh, and uh, it's beautiful. Two stories of liquor store right there. And all glass. Big, like, giant Like, very glass modern, gorgeous. Wall. Yeah, it's, uh, the interesting thing is, is um, what we've seen under the Cox administration uh, with the design of liquor stores is there's been definitely sort of a more modernization of the look. There's also mm-hmm. been uh, refrigerated beer cases, beer caves that have been put in the new ones. And that's as they have the budget for it. They obviously can't retrofit all the stores that are right now. But as they go forward, uh, Executive Director Tiffany Clayson has told me that she would like to see the beer caves and things like that built into the future stores. Yeah, huge. Okay, the thing that might also change our alcohol buying and bar going experience in the coming years that I know Utah's been working on is the virtual ID, like being able to have your identification on your phone. Do you think that that's something that might get tightened up or finalized this legislative session? So it's available now through the Department of Public Safety, uh, which runs the driver license division. You can download the app right now. I have it on Mm -hmm. my own phone. What I've observed personally has been the issue is a lot of bars just don't have the technology yet. They don't have it themselves to be able to to read it. Okay. So at least for now, uh, and I think it's as people upgrade their systems on their end as a small business owner, as a bar or hospitality group, you'll see more adoption of that. But you can download it today if you wanted that mobile driver license. Just not sure how far it'll be used, at least not for the short term. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Ben Winslow, I got to ask you, if you're raising a glass this holiday season, what's in it? Old Sandy. (laughs) Still? Still. This was your answer last year, and I wanted to give you a... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you wanted me to just basically say I'm drinking something better. No, I'm still on my trashy nog. And I love it. I love it so. And I am Old proud. Old Santy. Old Santy. <laughs> yep. This is, it's got, it's bourbon, right? Is there rum in it too? I think so, yeah. <laughs> it's the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, nine ninety nine for 750 milliliters. It's got to be good. <laughs> you can't go wrong. It's just the happiest of holidays with that stuff. Fox 13 reporter Ben Winslow, thank you so much for your time. 
Happy holidays. My pleasure. You as well. If you have yet to lay eyes on it, the new downtown Salt Lake liquor store on 3rd South and 2nd East is looking good. According to the DABS, it should be open by late spring or early summer of next year. That is all for us today here on CityCast Salt Lake. Thank you for listening. We will be back tomorrow morning with more from around this city. Bye. Bye.